Well, it's 8.30 and we have a quorum, so I guess I'll get started. Um, <clears throat> a few preliminary words before I call the meeting to order. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us for the, uh, the city. What we have to believe is the city's first teleconference city council meeting being conducted under uh, state statute authorizing us in this extraordinary time to do so. We have a few announcements to make regarding this teleconference meeting. If the teleconference is disconnected at any time during the meeting, the meeting shall be stopped and reconvened once the audio connection is restored. If communications are unable to be restored within 30 minutes, items remaining for consideration will be continued uh, to March 31st, uh, later today at one o'clock via teleconference. We have no reason to think that that will happen, but we just wanted to plan ahead for that uh, potential uh, scenario. The agenda and documents are located on okc.gov. And as an aside, I'll say to find the page, I often just Google OKC.gov uh, agendas or meetings, and you can find it that way for sure. Uh, and you can follow along with what we're doing today. Anyone wishing to speak about an agenda item, public hearing, or to speak under citizens to be heard, I'm going to give you a couple options here. And you might want to grab a pencil uh, if, you, uh, if you think that this is something you're going to want to do. The phone number to call is 405 297 2391. So that's 405 297 2391. That's to uh, go ahead and sign up in advance to speak. You could also text that number for texting that you would like to speak on a particular item or under citizens to be heard. It's 405 219 7927. So that texting number is 405 219 7927. Um, either way, please provide your name, phone number, the item number, and the reason you wish to comment. If you call in after your item has been heard, you can still potentially speak under citizens to be heard because that's near the end of the meeting. Uh, speakers will be allowed three minutes to comment. I ask that all participants except the council members keep their phones on mute until they are recognized to speak. Uh, council, of course, is invited to jump in, ask questions or comment at any time during the meeting. Uh, if you, I've got my phone, uh, council members have my cell phone. If they would like to text, uh, they're welcome to, uh, but they can also just speak up. Call meeting to order. Oh, I'm just, now I'm just like reading off a teleprompter. Sorry, now I will now call the meeting to order. Mayor, and, can you uh, hear me? Yeah. This is James Cooper. Yeah, welcome, Councilman Cooper. Yeah, sorry, we had technical um, difficulties on our end. <laughs> uh, Very good. Mayor, All right. Well, with the uh, formalities out of the way, I will now call the meeting to order. And uh, Francis, uh, did you want to do a roll call? Yes. Uh, this is Francis Kersey, and I'm going to do the official uh, roll call for the call to order. Uh, Mayor Holt? Yes, present. Councilman Greiner? Present. Councilman Cooper? Present. Councilman McAtee? Present. Councilman Stone. I'm here. Councilman Greenwall. Here. Councilman Greenwall, thank you. Uh, Councilwoman here. Hammond. Here. Councilwoman Nye. Here. Councilman Stone Cipher. Present, thank you. All right, thank you. Fran, that's that voice you'll hear probably quite a bit during this meeting is Francis Kersey, the city clerk. Uh, we will have to do all votes by roll call. So as we, uh, that'll probably be the most tedious part of this meeting is uh, all the voting, but uh, that's who will be handling that. We'll start with item two, uh, Office of the Mayor. We have items A through H here. Item A is notification that Councilman Todd Stone will become vice mayor on April 8th. And items B through H are appointments to COTPA, uh, HP, uh, City County Health, that's timely, uh, City Oklahoma City Park Commission, Riverfront Redevelopment Authority, Riverfront Design Committee, um, and the Traffic Commission. And I would also point out that item C was corrected in a timely manner, and it should have said John Milner, not John Myler. Uh, we can take items A through H uh, with one motion. Move the item. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? And, and when I say any further discussion, normally I look around and, and kind of look at your faces, but now I'll have to uh, ask you to speak up at that moment. 
And presuming none, I will uh, move forward and ask Francis to call the roll for a vote on a motion for items 2A through H. Councilman Greiner? Wow. Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Greenwald? Yes. <laughs> Hammond? Yes. Nice? Yes. Stone Cypher? Yes. Uh, motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to item three, Journal of Council Proceedings. We have two items here we could take with one motion. Move the items. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I would ask the clerk to read the roll. Greiner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwald? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nine? Yes. Yes. Mayor. Yes. You didn't call me earlier, did you? Yeah. I'll be like to be recorded as Jeff on the previous note as well. <laughs> um, okay. Motion passes unanimously. Now moving on to item four, re request for uncontested continuances. Listed on the agenda is item 8A1, uh, which will be continued to April 28th. Mr. City Manager, are there any other items? Uh, yes, there are. <laughs> Starting on page 18, item 8L1, the dilapidated structures. Item D, all of these items will be stricken from the agenda. Item D, 2701 Northeast 21st Street, to re-notify the owner. Item E, 1014 Northeast 22nd Street, to re-notify the owner. I'm sorry, the owner is removed. On page 19, item 8M1, unsecured structures. Item G, 2132 North Lottie Avenue, the owner has secured. Item H, 2136 North Lottie Avenue, the owner has secured. Item U, 1306 Southwest 27th Street, to re-notify for a new owner. Item X, 22 Southeast 31st Street, the owner has secured. Item Y, 717 Southwest 32nd Street, the owner has secured. On page 20, to continue, item 8M1, unsecured structures, item AA, 2418 Southwest 44th Street, the owner is secured. All those items are stricken from the agenda. On page 20, item 8N1, abandoned buildings, all of these items will be stricken from the agenda. Item D, 2132 North Lottie Avenue, the owner is secured. Item, 21, item E, 2136 North Lottie Avenue, the owner is secured. And item K, 2701 Northeast 21st Street, to re-notify the owner. That's all the items I have. Thank you. Uh, we have no revoca revocable permits under item five, so we'll recess the council meeting and now convene at the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority, where we have items A through F we could take with one motion. Move the item. Second. second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, oh. clerk, please call the roll. Greiner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwald? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nye? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. And I would ask everyone uh, who is not a council member to mute your phone, please. Um, you may you may think I'm not speaking to you, and I don't know who I'm speaking to, but there's definitely some chatter in the background. And please, if you are listening to this call and you are not a council member, please mute your phone. Um, and even if you are a council member, if there's people talking in your in your space, we can uh, we can hear it. So. Please, uh, I will now adjourn OCMSA and convene as Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, um, where we have three items we can take with one motion. Move the items. Second. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. 
Greiner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwald? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Knight? Yes. Stone Pfeiffer? Yes. Mayor? Yes, motion passes unanimously. Um, we'll now adjourn OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, where by custom we typically vote on claims and payroll, even though that's uh, debatable whether we need to, but uh, let's go ahead and do it. Uh, would there be a motion for adoption of the one item under o uh, OCEAT? Move the item. Move approval. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Reiner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwald? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nice? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. We'll now adjourn OCEAT, convene at the council meeting. Uh, reconvene at the council meeting where we find ourselves on the consent docket, item six. I believe I'm aware of only one item that may have a few words to say about, and that is item F, uh, that we'll have a very brief presentation. Council members, uh, just try to speak up real quick here if there's something that you wanted to speak to here. Yes, this is Councilwoman Hammond. I also wanted um, to pull AS. Uh, for further discussion and um, just information from our chief of police. A S S, S is in Sam. Sam. Okay. Mayor, this yes. is Councilperson Cooper. When we get to that particular item, um, even though I'm on a leave of absence this year from OKCPS, I think it's probably wise that I recuse myself from this conversation. <laughs> Okay, so we'll so we'll do a separate vote then uh, that does not include you on that item. Thank you. Um, so we had we had a request on um, for the chief of police to speak to AF one. So just the F one, right? F one, right? Yeah. Is there anything else that anybody else wants to talk about before we go to that? Okay, we'll start there then. Uh, F one. Uh, chief Gorley, are you chief on? Gorley? Chief Corley is participating. He's currently muted, though. He would need to unmute himself. What was that? Chief Corley, if you'll dial the phone, it will unmute. So the phone that Chief Corley's on needs to be unmuted so that he can speak to this item. Gorley? Sixteenth Street. Okay, so why don't we deal with the other item? We can call Chief Gorley and see what's going on. Um, the other item was item eight S and Councilwoman Hammond, you wanted to speak to that? Well, I did, yeah, I wanted to ask the chief a few more questions just about oh. how this looks and works uh, with okay. having police in our schools. So, um, all yeah, right, well, we never mind. That also involves also involves the chief. Okay. You may chief? try star six because that's what what happened with mine. Chief, are you there? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, we got you. All right, Chief, let's go back to item uh, item F1, Chief. Okay, sorry about that. I was unmuting, but it wouldn't wouldn't take it, so it finally did after a couple of tries. Uh, Wade Gorley, Chief of Police, I want to make sure, um, are you talking about the Magnus Leadership Training? Yes. Okay, um, this is part of a continuation of a uh, process that we've been working on for a couple of years in improving leadership throughout the police department. Um, one of the initial steps was uh, we changed our 
uh, leadership training for new supervisors. We just did our first training school with that and made it a two-week school with more hands-on type learning and scenario-based learning. Part of that, too, was last year we did a uh, uh, program through Strata Leadership that took every uh, supervisor up to myself um, through a leadership process and in, in, uh, leadership skills and and how to determine our leadership styles and uh, um, training was very well received. So this is a continuation in that program. And this is a, another leadership training that we'll be putting everybody through on the police department. This is a little more in-depth type training and it deals with uh, crisis management, which under the circumstances I think will be very good for our department. Um, and uh, the training has been uh, something that's been very well received in uh, other areas. And we're pretty excited about this. And again, every, from the lieutenant all the way up to myself, we'll go through this training process and then we'll get together afterwards and determine implementation and how we uh, improve our leadership throughout the police department through this training. Okay, thank you, Chief. Any questions for the Chief? Hearing none, uh, Chief, can you also speak to item uh, AF? AF, uh, Councilwoman Hammond wanted to uh, maybe ask you a question about that. Uh, Councilwoman Hammond, you want to start? Sure, yeah, I was just kind of curious how, you know, I saw some information in the memo just about, you know, that this is a contract that we have with the um, Pub OKC Public School District. Um, and I'm just curious how many officers this pays for, like what their role in the school is and kind of how the, the program looks. Um, I don't have the exact number on the campus resource officers. I can get you that. Um, but their role in the secure in the school is uh, basically security, uh, providing security for the uh, schools that they're in and making sure, um, you know, with school violence and things that go on around the country, they're there as a deterrent for that. Um, and uh, uh, as, uh, we have campus resource officers that are assigned to certain schools. And uh, they, again, they're just there to work with the administrators. Um, work with the students and make sure that, you know, things are going well in the school and that there's no violence or anything like that occurring. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to know how many and, and kind of what the, which schools, if it's just one in every public school, regardless of first or secondary, or um, if it's just middle and high school, or kind of how that looks across the district. Uh, yeah, if you could provide us that information at some point, I'd be appreciative. Yeah, it's it's secondary in high schools. Um, I can, I, if you need it, I can get you exactly which schools they're in, um, and we have all that information. Uh, if that's if that's something you need. Yeah, yeah, I'd appreciate that. Um, I I think just from my perspective that I don't know, two million dollars is a lot for the school district to be uh, providing providing security, um, whereas, you know, I think that that money being spent on counselors or um, other things that encourage, you know, safety of students among one another and them being able to, um, I think just kind of at, at my core, having police officers in our schools is, um, is just not, you know, the best use of resources. Um, so, that's what I just kind of wanted to get a sense more about how kind of it looks and which schools they're in. And um, so thank you. Yeah, these are, um, this, this is at the request of the school system. This is something that they've come to us and want us to provide. It's not something that we're forcing on them or, or putting out there sure. for them to do. This is the, what the school system has come to us and asked us to yeah. provide for them to make sure their students are safe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just, I guess on record, I'd like to encourage them to think about safety in maybe a more expansive way. So thank you so much. Yeah, I would also like that information, and this is Councilwoman Nice, um, as it pertains to what schools the uh, officers are in, because I'm curious if, if there's a difference with urban uh, school districts or the schools in general um, and what that looks like when it comes to those, those resource officers. I mean, um, in, in my situation, growing up in public schools, that's, uh, we had officers, so I'm just curious to know uh, particularly if that's something that the school district asks for 
for the, those particular schools or how we relate and, and work with those schools for uh, the certain schools that are we have officers in. Okay, I can get that. So um, on that particular item, we need to have a separate vote um, so that Councilman Cooper may recuse. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to make a motion and go ahead and adopt that item, item 6AF? I'd move item 6AF. Second. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll, absent uh, Councilman Cooper's name. Greiner? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? No. Knight? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Uh, motion carries seven to one. Uh, now we have the rest of the consent docket. We could take with one motion. Move the consent docket. Second. Second. We've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner? Yes. Cooper? McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwall? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nice? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Okay, Cooper is absent. Yeah. This is, this is Cooper. No. Was that the consent vote? Yes, uh, without the, the item you needed to recuse from. Did you wish to vote yes on that item? Yes. I mean, on the consent docket? On the consent docket, please. Yes, okay. All right, motion carries unanimously. Moving on now to the concurrence docket, item seven. We have items A through J. We can take with one motion. Move the item. Is there a second? Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Knight? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. All right, um, we're now at item eight, items requiring separate votes. Item 8A1 was deferred to April 28th. Uh, as I present items on this particular part of it, the planning items, I will mention whether someone has already signed up to speak. We have a couple. Item 8A2 is uh, 9507 West Memorial Road from AA to PUD. 1742 and uh, Councilman Stone Cipher Kendall Dillon is the applicant uh, or representing the applicant and he is on the line and has signed up to speak if necessary. He said he does, he's just here if there are questions. I'll turn it over to you, Councilman Stone Cipher. Thank you, Ron. It is an ordinance on final hearing to rezone the property. Uh, it is to permit a modified office and residential use. It went before the uh, Planning Commission on February 13th and was approved. Uh, there are no protests, so I would move uh, the ordinance. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Yeah, this is Councilman Hammond. I had a question about why um, TE3 was deleted um, and what that pertained to. And my understanding is that there was something that staff was wanting, um, but it got maybe deleted in the planning commission. So Bob Tiener is available to speak to that one if Bob can unmute the phone that he's on. This is Bob Tiener, Development Services Director. The plan that was the discussion was about residential sprinklers because this plaid is outside the rural response time 
Uh, the Planning Commission discussed it, and the majority recommended that that TE be deleted. Can you speak to what that rural response time means and why why it would make sense to delete that? Well, the, the rural response time is um, six and a half minutes from a fire station. And at this, at this point, there's not a new station in that area. And the uh, fire chief felt that they needed to consider uh, fire sprinklers to, for public safety. But in this area, there's multiple developments that are already existing and the planning commission felt that it, this wasn't really the appropriate time to add that requirement to this development okay. so we have a we have a motion and second your honor yeah we do is there any any other questions on the item right behind him 80 on monday okay I think hearing none, uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Briner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAfee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? No. Knight? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Uh, motion carries eight to one. Moving on to item 8A3. And again, if someone is uh, not on the council, please mute your phone. 8A3, we've got 1620 North Blackwelder Avenue going from SPUD 942 to SPUD 1162. Uh, no one has signed up to speak. Councilwoman Hammond? Yeah, this is um, an application to essentially uh, permit an Airbnb in, a, in home sharing in a um, development um, in the Plaza District, and I will motion for approval. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing Four. none, clerk, please call, please call the roll. Briner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. Terrible. McKee? I am bad yes. at coughing. Stone? Aye. Uh, Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Knight? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, item Mayor, eight. Mayor, Mayor, yeah. this is this is James Cooper. I'm not really sure what the protocol is here. I the not this one with Councilperson Hammond, but the previous one with Councilperson Stonepiper, AA2. I thought we were on AA1, so I was reading that incorrectly. My planning commissioner was one of the no votes on AA2, and I. I would actually, if it is possible, I'd like to vote no instead of yes on that. If not, then fine, but I would at least like it noted that my planning commissioner ha was one Mayor, of the no votes. Uh, yeah, we would have to rescind. We would have to have a motion to rescind the vote, right? And they, then vote on that motion and then motion to pass the item again is that yeah, right? correct a motion to reconsider and if that passes then you have a motion on the item again and then you have a re vote so I, councilman cooper you would need to make a motion to rescind the passage of 8a2 if you wish to do that then i would like to make that motion to rescind second all right there's a motion and a second to rescind the vote on item 8a2 uh clerk please call the roll Briner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? No. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Knight? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes, motion carries uh, eight to one. 
Uh, Councilman Stuntsifer, would you like to make another motion to approve item 8A2? For the second time, I'd move the item, please. <laughs> second. second. All right. Motion and a second. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Briner? Yes. Cooper? No. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? No. Knight? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes, please. Mayor? Yes. Yeah, motion carries seven to two. Okay. Um, we did item 8A3, correct? That's handled? Yes. Okay. So we're on item 8A4, uh, 3237 Northwest 192nd Street, going from PUD 1686 to SPUD 1194, Councilman Stonecipher. And there's no one who has signed up to speak. Thank you, Your Honor. This is an ordinance on final hearing to rezone the property to permit office development. It was approved February 13th uh, by the Planning Commission. There are no protests. So at this time, I would move the item, please. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Griner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Knight? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes, motion passes unanimously. 8B is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval. It closes the south 10 feet of West Park Place right of way between Classen and Western. The applicant, Tim Johnson, uh, is available for questions. Councilwoman Hammond. Yes, this is um, uh, some time ago, a few months ago, we uh, approved this area to come under the downtown um, design <coughs> overlay. Um, it's going to be uh, um, developed into senior housing, so this is just a kind of checking the box of some right of way and I will move for approval. Second. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Griner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Five. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Knight? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes, motion passes unanimously. Uh, 8C, this is an ordinance on final hearing. This relates to uh, parking penalties uh, for blocking the streetcar. We had a presentation and then a public hearing on this item. Uh, today would potentially be the final hearing on it um, and potential vote, but I think maybe we have some council members who would like to defer it. Is that correct? Yes, this is Councilwoman Hammond. Um, Councilperson Cooper and I met with Jason Fairbrush and Jesse Rush um, two weeks ago, whenever, whenever that was. Um, and if either of them are available, I'd kind of like them to speak to our discussion, just sort of in brief. Um, they made this really handy packet uh, for us about some of the parts. They actually have um, assigned numbers to all of the parking spots along the streetcar route, and we're showing that they've actually been tracking blockages per spot. Um, and as of this year, have been doing that per month per spot. Um, and even from last year's data, there's a pretty obvious um, area of a few hot spots that is kind of the words we ended up using, the phrase, the term we use for it, where a lot of them are not really a problem. It's these handful of spots that are in areas where there's some drop-off loading um, kind of going on. There's areas around Myriad that maybe people who aren't as familiar with parking downtown <coughs> typically park. And what we discovered from that meeting is that currently there is no signage posted about what the current sign is. Um, so
So we asked, we asked Jason and Jesse whether it might be possible to defer this item a few months out, um, especially now with COVID. Obviously, you know, downtown is a little different at the moment. Um, so I don't know. That might need to be, you know, extended out to, um, I don't know, like July or August to maybe reconsider. But I know for my concern, and I'll let Councilperson Cooper speak to anything he had as well. My concern was, to me, it doesn't really make sense to up a fine when we're not even posting about what the current fine is, and that maybe posting about the current fine, particularly in those hot spots, might be um, might be the next you know step to figure out if we can get lower blockages just by posting information about what the current fine is. Um, so with that, I, I, is Jason or Jesse available on the call maybe to speak to that as well? Jason. So while well, Jason, I don't know if you can unmute the phone where you are. Uh, the council members had asked that we look at this and, and Jason has talked with me about it and said they've identified some of those hotspot areas as Councilman Hamlin was uh, mentioning and um, they looked at the areas where we have the biggest problems and felt like if we put some signage in those areas specifically, you know, not to put clutter of signage throughout all of downtown, but to try to identify those areas where we could possibly put some of that in. I've looked at that and made the request that we um, consider uh, to our staff that we look at uh, some signage there that would allow us to assess if the current fine level would have more effect with more notice to people that they could be fined. Um, and so they're looking at that and looking at the areas. And Jason, are you on? Well, if Jason's not able to get unmuted, um, I guess I would like to motion for a deferral. Um, you know, how, how long would you like to defer? Councilwoman Hammond, uh, July 21st. Okay. That that okay. seems like a good. Uh, we can maybe revisit it then and and see maybe if we'd like what we'd like to do <laughs> if things have changed a little bit. <laughs> and I second that. This is Cooper. Mayor, uh, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the deferral to July? What was it, Francis? Yeah. 21st. July 21st. Mayor, this is Mark Stonecipher. I'd like to comment on this for a second. Um, yeah. The one thing that I would really like to hear from Jason before we move this all the way to July 21st, and I know we're having some technical difficulties, but when we have 90 shutdowns a month because of this problem, uh, it, it, I sure would like to hear from Jason. So would it be, uh, Joe, yeah, would I, you be okay if we just pass it to the to the next? Council? Well, we're working on it. Hold on. Let's see. I am, I am here. I'm off. I'm oh, off on <laughs> now. This is Jason. Okay. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, so, uh, well, granted, um, granted, the blockages continue to be a problem for us, but we, we just started tracking uh, blockages by space in January, whereas before we'd always track just blockages, you know, by block face and then for the entire system. And, and we have, with at least two months of data now, January and February, we have identified like four locations along the route that are giving us, you know, the most problems. Um, and so whether we do, you know, signage or um, more active, you know, patrolling of, of the area, we would start with those, I mean, our recommendation would be to start with those four areas that are giving us the most problems anyway. So, um, I mean, as staff, we're certainly open to, to try and, uh, you know, to put the, put the signage ad advising people not only will they be towed, but they could be fined and seeing if that, you know, seeing if that helps. We have our baseline and we think we've got two months worth of data now put the signs out there for two months, I think we'd have a pretty accurate comparison, you know, once normal business resumes. Um, so, you know, we're certainly inclined to trying it and we think, you know, concentrating on those areas that are giving us the most problems, you know, will certainly give us the most, the most benefit. Well, I guess the question I have, Jason, this is Mark Stone Cipher. Uh, do we have, are we still having 90 shutdowns a month? And, uh, and is there any evidence that by putting up these signs, it's going to make any difference whatsoever? 
Yeah, so we are we are still looking at January and February. Um, we are still looking at about 90 blockages uh, a month. I can tell you that in these these locations, the city council meeting. What? Let's see here. Oh, I have the the information. It's the. Uh... So. Um, what I was going to say is for these four locations that we've identified, for example, uh, one location in particular, Robinson southbound between Park and Main, in January, that area alone uh, made up 14 of the 90 blockages. And then in February, 15 of the 91 blockages were in that area alone. So then if we take that top, you know, problem area and we add the next three you know, highest problem areas. Um, we're looking at about 30 blockages coming from about four areas along the route. So, you know, about a third of our our problems are in these concentrated areas. So if we can get that under control, uh, then obviously they come down significantly, um, but won't, you know, no guarantees we're gonna get rid of, of everything, of course. But I thought it was interesting that we have that one area that's generating almost 14 or 15 blockages just in four parking spaces. Yeah, and this is Cooper here. I So the conversation when we met with Jason and Jesse, um, the story I told that – the two stories that kind of worry me just from my campaigning days – one was, you know, I met with a friend at Clarity Coffee on Main Street um, just to talk movies and stuff one day, very early in the campaign. And we went for a walk around City Hall. And he said to me that that was the first time he's done that. He lives around 122nd in May. And his only association with downtown up until our walk has been going to municipal court to pay fines. And this isn't like some troubled kid, this, you know, parking fines or, you know, speeding or whatever. That's his only interaction. And that, I have to say, that's fairly common with people. And then the second thing, second story is when I was knocking doors, the further I got from downtown, you know, remember Ward 2 goes up to 122nd. The further I got away from downtown, the, the more likely the it was I would hear someone say that they don't go to downtown and they, you know, no matter all the renaissance of this area they, they associate it with you know lack of parking and they associate it with too much parking uh, costs or just you know all that sort of stuff and i just don't want this streetcar uh fine um to be yet another you know kind of bit of that narrative for people i don't want people to associate downtown with being an unwelcoming inaccessible place and i'd rather exhaust our effort before we you know take that um that step and to that point Jason is July a, a reasonable amount of time or what time would you give that would allow us to really measure some metrics here well I think we need we need two months of normal business activity so mm -hmm. two months from when our normal business resumes would be my suggestion um, also uh, relatedly that, that, but go ahead relatedly Jason you using the word normal um, makes me wonder if, you know, we don't know when everything's going to be back up and really, truly, you know, outside of social distancing would, I mean, how can we really measure it, you know, in April and May when we know for sure the social distancing is going to last through the end of April? I would not at all be surprised to see it last through May and June, but I, I don't know, July seems like the right a good guess. I guess this is Mark Stone type here. I guess the question I'd have for Jason is, if we know we have four problem areas, how long is it going to take you to put up signs there? Oh, we can have that that done in a probably a matter of weeks. I mean, maybe maybe shorter than that, just based on the availability of getting the signs ordered. But yeah, we we plan to have those those up as soon as the city manager directs us to do so, if he does. I, I, Joe Beth, I don't have any problem moving this to July, but I, I'd ask that we also add to the motion that we go forward with the signs in the four locations. Sure. 
Yeah, no, I'm totally fine with that. I think from my, you know, from the question of whether we think the signs will make a difference, I think the thing that came out of that meeting for me was I didn't even know there was a sign potentially associated. So my concern is, you know, if that's the case for most people, um, you know, why increasing it, you know, the fact that there's a fine alone seems like that we need to educate people about that before we think about increasing it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm completely fine with, you know, adding that we add or adding to my motion that we, add those signs because I think that, um, that education let me just let me just jump in we don't have to add that to the motion let me recognize the city manager to, to state something okay yeah so I've understood the conversation I've been in, in discussion with Jason about this so I understand what okay. we're asking for here and I would rather us not have it within the motion just so that we have flexibility mm -hmm. for the number of signs if we see another area that's a problem that we okay. will manage that I, I understand the direction on this so he'll Thank put you. up signs in other words yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, we do have a citizen who signed up to speak on this item. Uh, I hope we can make this technically work. Gary Goldman. So uh, what's the star six is one trick. That yes, you have star to six to unmute yourself, Mr. Goldman. Can you hear me? Yes, Gary. All right, perfect. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a couple quick things um, on this topic. Um, you know, as far as signage is concerned um, and spending money on signage, just one thing to take into consideration that, uh, of course, any any type of, of communication um, or signage, you know, might help. But just to take into consideration, we're also dealing with with human beings and human error being able to uh, perfectly parallel park uh, on a regular basis uh, on the inside of the white line, including um, uh, parallel parking is, you know, a, a challenge in itself. We're expecting people to parallel park. Not a lot of people that come down on a regular basis and make sure their mirror is not touching the line. So uh, I'm not sure if a sign will help um, or not. Um, um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, the, a lot of the feedback that we get as a small business uh, in the downtown area is that <clears throat> the streetcar takes too long. And uh, some of us feel that it takes too long due to this issue that we're talking about. Um, so, you know, trying to find a solution um, far as being able to park uh, anywhere along the streetcar path is, is definitely a, a, a large topic that needs to be discussed, whether it's today or whether it's moved to July, uh, July 21st. Okay. Thank you. All right. We have a motion and a second on the table to defer this item to July 21st. Any further discussion from the members of council? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Knight? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Yeah. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, that item is deferred. Now we're moving on to item 8B. This is the public hearing uh, regarding the ordinance that was presented uh, at our last meeting, introduced, I should say, at our last meeting, and a presentation was made. Uh, this relates to feeding animals in city parks and other city property. Um, today is merely the public hearing. No one has signed up to speak. I will uh, open it to the floor for about five seconds if anyone else would like to speak on this item. Hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, items eight, E, F, G, H, I, J are all not quite ready. Um, and so we will, we will uh, return to them a little later in our agenda. We will now move on to eight, K, one and two. Um, 8K1 is a public hearing regarding the refunding of certain outstanding portions of the city's general obligation bonds. 
uh, series 2010 issued in the original principal amount of approximately $64 million. Resolu uh, item two is a resolution providing for the sale and issuance of general obligation refunding bonds in the amount not to exceed $35 million, et cetera. And I believe Brent Bryant will speak to these items. Yes, sir, Mayor Brent, Brent Bryant. Way to go. Yes, sir. Uh, Brent Bryant, Finance Director. Um, in 2010, the city issued the $64.4 million worth of general obligation bonds. Uh, per our standard, um, standard we, we made these bonds callable and uh, beginning with the maturities starting on March uh, 1st of 2021. And what we're seeking your approval today is to authorize us to um, issue refunding bonds in the amount not to exceed $35 million uh, <coughs> uh, at a negotiated price uh, to be negotiated probably in the middle of April. Um, our policy, our debt management policy says that we have to at least achieve a 3% present value savings. Uh, right now, based on current market conditions, we believe it'll be over 4% savings, which will equal about a million and a half dollars. And I'm happy to answer any other questions. Any questions for Brent from the council? Hearing none, um, let me formally state, uh, again, no one has signed up to speak on 8K1, but is there anyone else who wishes to speak under that public hearing? I'll pause for a good, healthy five seconds. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion for the item found at 8K2, the resolution providing for sale and issuance of the GO refunding bond. Move the resolution for approval. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Briner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Dome? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nice. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Motion passes unanimously and with the six affirmative votes required. Mayor. Uh, and seven is mayor. We need a motion on Jay. Did you the the one that was Brett Bryant? Oh, we're gonna go back to that. We skipped over yeah, we skipped yeah. over E through J. Okay. Um item 8L1 is the public hearing regarding the dilapidated structures here listed, except for the one stricken at the beginning of the meeting. Is there anyone on the call? No one has signed up to speak, but is there anyone on the call who wishes to speak under this public hearing? I'll wait about five seconds. Move the resolution. Uh, okay, you kind of jumped the gun, but that's all right. I'll take that as a motion for 8L2. Uh, adoption of the resolution declaring that the structures are dilapidated. We've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Knight? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes, motion carries unanimously. All right, 8M1 is a public hearing regarding the unsecured structures uh, here listed, except for the ones stricken at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, no one has signed up to speak, but I will wait about five seconds here to ask if anyone on the line wishes to speak under this public hearing. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the resolution found at 8M2 declaring that the structures are unsecured? Move the resolution. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nice? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? 
Yes, motion passes unanimously. 8N1 is a public hearing regarding the abandoned buildings here listed, except for the ones stricken at the beginning of the meeting. No one has signed up to speak, but I will wait about five seconds and ask if anyone wishes to speak under this public hearing. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to uh, adopt the resolution found at 8N2 declaring that the buildings are abandoned. If, if, Move the resolution. The whole city Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner? Yes. Cooper? <clears throat> yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Bye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nice? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor. Yes, motion passes unanimously. Okay, 801 is a public hearing regarding the fiscal year 2020 budget amendment that was presented at our last meeting that was mostly adding the MAPS 4 uh, funds to the remainder of this current uh, fiscal year. 802 is a resolution adopting that amendment. First, let me ask if anyone wishes to speak uh, under the public hearing portion found at 801, the public hearing regarding this budget amendment. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adopt the resolution found at 802 uh, that includes this amendment to our fiscal year 2020 budget. Move the resolution. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nye? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Uh, yes, motion carries unanimously. Okay, now we're at 8P. This is a joint resolution with the Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust approving an allocation uh, of $5.5 million from the GO Limited Tax Bond proceeds for the OKC Small Business Continuity Fund. This is a proposal uh, to provide uh, support for our small businesses um, as they react and respond to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as we well know, many businesses are suffering a disproportionate uh, well, probably all businesses are suffering to some extent, but some more than others uh, due to the uh, unique nature of the pandemic and how it affects certain businesses, uh, causing them to be public health threats. And this is something that we've talked about for the last two weeks, being very important that we respond to the secondary effects of COVID-19 just as much as the primary effects. And I really want to congratulate and thank the uh, Alliance for Economic Development, the Chamber of Commerce, and our own city staff uh, for developing this so proactively and so quickly. And I believe we have some presentations on this. Uh, Mr. City Manager, you want to introduce that? Yeah, so Kathy O'Connor is uh, with us, and she's going to just give a quick overview of the um, plan with the program. Um, Kathy, if you're on, and can unmute. I am here. Can you hear Excellent. me? Yes, we got you. Okay, great. Um, so we developed this program in conjunction with the Chamber of Commerce and city staff in order to provide some financial assistance to those businesses, especially small businesses that are impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The proposal before you today um, asks for an allocation of $5.5 million from the general obligation limited tax bond proceeds that were authorized by the voters in 2017 for economic development and community development. Um, the way that the program is structured right now is that it is um, intended for those businesses that can show that they've had a significant decline in business, 50% year over year in their sales um, since March 16th of 2020, and that they receive a majority of their revenues from on location um, sales or transactions. Um, obviously, the businesses have to be located in the city limits. Um, 
they need a priority will be given to businesses that have operated for at least a year. Um, and to the fullest extent possible, we have a goal to allocate 25% of the funding for these programs to businesses that are located in low to moderate income census tracts. So that's kind of the broad overview of the program. More specifically, um, the program includes a um, proposed $1.5 million allocation to fund incentive payments to businesses with less than 15 full-time employees in an amount up to $10,000 to reimburse them for their payroll expenses. Um, this program is really designed to help businesses retain employees. Um, first of all, we think that's important from um, an economic standpoint that we need employees being paid and having the resources to support their families but also because of the nature of this money and that it is intended for economic development, the creation and retention of jobs is, is critical to meeting the legal requirements for these economic development funds. So that's the incentive payment, up to $10,000 reimbursement for payroll of retained employees. The second program is a small business loan program that has two parts. And these, these programs are both intended for businesses of 50 employees or fewer. Um, the first one is a, a, a no interest rate forgivable loan of up to $50,000 that would be forgiven over time if the business meets certain requirements such as long-term job retention. So the idea is that they use these resources to keep their employees on the payroll. Um, the second part of the program is a low interest loan of between fifty and a hundred thousand um, dollars. We would provide these at a low interest rate. Um, again, qualifying businesses would have to have less than fifty full time employees. And the final part of the program is to provide some technical assistance to these small businesses. Um, we've had a lot of questions from from businesses about teleworking or developing a more robust online e-commerce platform or how, how to help with navigating the federal um, stimulus package and the SBA process. So um, we thought that setting up a $500,000 allocation to help fund some resources for these small businesses would be, um, would, is important. Um, a few other things about the program is that you can't, businesses will not be allowed to stack programs, you, you can apply for a grant, or you can apply for one of the loans. You can't do all three. You can't do, you can get a grant, you can get a loan, a loan. Um, any of the businesses can access the small business technical assistance. Um, and in fact, if, even if they don't want a grant or a loan, we could, we could make the technical assistance available. Um, we plan to use a local bank to help us with the underwriting and servicing of the loan program. The uh, incentive payment applications will be reviewed by a, a, a team of staff people from the city, the chamber and the alliance, and then reviewed by a disbursement committee that will be set up by the city manager. Um, the resolution also gives the city manager authority to move money between these four different programs. If, for example, we get much more demand for the incentive payments than we do the loans, we could, we could potentially move money between the programs. So um, at the current time, we're working very hard to develop an online platform for businesses to apply for the program. We are working on application forms and the ability to upload the appropriate documents to prove eligibility. Um, and we are um, obviously developing marketing materials and an FAQ and, and lots of different things, but none of those have been completed, you know, pending your action today. So um, that pretty much sums up my comments. I'll be glad to try to answer any questions you might have. Kathy, this is Mark Stone Cipher. One question I had was, as far as the internal and administrative costs not to exceed an amount, can you explain that a little? And will that will that cost include uh, the underwriting, et cetera, performed by local banks? 
Um, well, at this point in time, yes, we have, we believe that there's an allocation of five hundred thousand dollars as a part of the resolution to cover our administrative costs. At this point in time, we have had a local bank come forward and offer to do the underwriting and servicing for free. So um, we're hoping that those costs are minimal. Um, and then, um, you know, but, but there will be expenses associated with staff time, um, you know, just getting the program up and running, some potential marketing, media kinds of expenses. Um, and then we are going to develop an online platform, and I don't, I don't know completely if that will cost us anything or not at this time. Sure. Sure. Kathy, will there be a point in time we can identify the local bank that's going to provide those services for free so that we can thank them? Absolutely. Yeah. Once we formalize that relationship, I'd rather have that a little further along. Um, another thing that, um, you know, we, we, we hope to be able to begin accepting applications on April 6th. I don't know that we'll be able to get everything in place before then just because of some of the technical requirements for the website we want to make sure that we get it right and that we're not having you know technical issues for people when they apply thank you kathy yeah kathy this is david greenwell uh, yes first of all thank you and the staff and everybody involved for coming so quickly with this program uh, you know, time is of the essence in situations like this, so thank you for pulling this together so quickly. I want to just urge caution uh, and a good overview, oversight of the disbursements related to the technical or professional services that may be provided, you know, up to the $500,000 amount. So the SBA uh, that gets involved in these types of activities on a regular basis are very concerned uh, with with uh, how their funds will be spent. They do not allow any kind of contingent fees as it relates to professional fees to assist in the application. And I would just caution that the Oversight Committee uh, adopt some of their guidelines, Are the SBA in guidelines, in terms of how they pay for professional fees and to make sure everything appears reasonable uh, in terms of the uh, request for that type of assistance. And then, yeah, I, second, so our, our, okay. go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go, please, go ahead. Uh, what I was going to say is our plan is to issue a request for proposals or a request for qualifications and develop a list of qualified what vendors that, that we can then match businesses to and have some control over the scope of services. But I appreciate your comments about the SBA application. There are several, there are several things that are a part of that application that okay. we may Research put that. on ours because um, some disclaimers process. about you know, evidence that their decline in business is the result of COVID-19 um, and things like that. So I appreciate your comments. Yes. And then my, my final question is, will the city auditor be able to review this program at some point in time just to ensure compliance with the guidelines um, and that whatever the criteria is that's established in terms of determining who will get funding and how much that it's applied uniformly and and just wanted to make sure that, that is, our city auditor has the ability to review this program at some point in time yes yes absolutely okay. um, brent bryant's already been in conversations with with the city auditor and we've actually um volunteered a couple of his staff to help review applications. So I hope that, that we will definitely have the auditors um, review and approval of the program. Thank you very much. Again, thank you and, and all the staff that were involved with this. They're all in remote mode, it sounds like. They're Please mute they're your on. phone if you're not on the council or Kathy O'Connor. <laughs> 
Um, this is Councilman Hammond. I have a few questions, um, and I don't know if it would be Kathy or the city manager, but do we have an idea of who would make up this disbursement committee? Um, kind of what, whether it's background or geography, like what is the kind of qualifications that um, would get someone on this disbursement committee? Well, I mean, for right now, it's, we don't really have the committee determined yet, um, but it's probably, you know, I will be on the committee, Brent and Joanna will, and Joanna McSpadden will be on the committee. Um, and then we, we might want to look at some bankers and other people that have some um, financial background to serve on the committee as well. That, that, those were our initial thoughts. But yes, some geographic disbursement, um, you know, experience disbursement would be um, helpful. I'd also be curious, um, as I've talked to small business owners over the weekend after this was made public, um, one of the concerns that I've gotten is that this is very much like a top-down sort of solution. And so they've come up with all sorts of questions and concerns about, you know, is, you know, I, I've heard from some people that, you know, their typical payroll of their, you know, 14, 10, whatever employees is over $10,000. So, you know, there's just some things that I feel like are maybe gaps in kind of what the actual needs are and what, um, what the program does. And so I'd be curious whether we can get some, whether it's um, entrepreneurial advisors or people who have owned a small business before, but maybe aren't interested in applying, um, people with that experience to, to whether it, it can, they just can have some input, particularly I think from areas of our community that are historically underrepresented, you know, um, people of color, women own businesses. So just kind of from that perspective, um, because I, I just do get concerned about some of those concerns that have been brought to me. You know, I, overall, I think we absolutely need this. And personally, I think we probably should have been doing something to this extent in a non-crisis mode, because I know there are so many parts of our city that um, particularly, you know, I think areas that have been historically redlined where it's really hard for, for businesses to get loans because they're seen as quote unquote risky investments. Um, you know, I think the small business loan program would have been amazing in the best of times um, for for businesses like that that have um, come from those areas. But, uh, you know, and so just my concern is, you know, is this enough in this time? Um, my other question, so oh. the, the census can I, can I Can I try to answer that one? Oh, first? sure. Yes, please. Just so we don't get to, um, so I don't lose track of what your questions sure. are. Um, so first of all, we have been talking to people who own small businesses, who provide assistance to small businesses. Um, we've talked to minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and, and they do think this will help. I do think we have to realize, though, that it may not be enough to solve one business's entire financial sure. problem that they're having right now. So we were trying to find something that we felt was impactful enough to make a difference for these businesses. Um, and, and frankly, I, you know, from, compared to some of the other cities that we looked at, our $10,000 is pretty generous compared to what some other communities are doing. Um, and I, I just think we have to be realistic about how many, how many people we can help um, and, and try to help maybe the ones that um, need it the most. Um, which is, you know, some of the 25% of these, you know, trying to distribute it to low and moderate income census tracts. But yeah, we, you know, totally understand that this may not solve everybody's problems. This is not enough sure. money to do that. Sure. Thank you. Um, one of my other questions is related to the census tract. So I think about, you know, that um, there are census tracts in Ward 6 that are quote unquote, low to moderate income um, or disadvantage, but one that's a little bit old data um, because things, you know, the city has changed quite a bit, particularly in parts of Ward 6. Um, so, you know, it, it, it sort of goes, like I think about opportunity zones where there are some areas that are in opportunity zones that are doing really well and they're fine on their own. They didn't really need that um, designation to lure 
investment. Um, so I guess my I'm just curious if there's any other metrics we'll be using besides the census tract to really make sure that we're helping the kind of traditionally overlooked um, you know areas of the city um, and those that those small businesses are located in. Um, like I kind of re referencing again back to uh, areas that have been historically redlined is a very different low income census tract than um, some areas of Ward 6 that, you know, th those folks probably have a, a good amount of um, whether it's capital or, or just maybe a longer runway, I guess, is the better way to put it. You know, everyone's hurting and in a crunch right now, obviously, because of the nature of this um, kind of slow motion disaster. But um but it doesn't erase the fact that, you know, a census tract, low income census tract in one part of the city is not necessarily translated exactly to other parts of the city, particularly for business owners of color. Um, so, yeah, I just was curious if there's any other metrics we could use and include to kind of narrow down that a little bit more. We can, we can look at it. I do think that we have to find something that is objectively measured by a third party to do this? Mm -hmm. I, I, or we open ourselves up for a lot of, of criticism. And we're going to get a lot of cri criticism anyway, um, because we won't <coughs> have enough money to go around. So um, sure. we'll, we'll try to do the best that we can. I mean, there, there, I do think that the measures of very low income census tracts are pretty accurate and, mm -hmm. um, and do reflect some of the things that you're talking about. So we'll we'll take a look at that. Um, my questions, I have a couple. Uh, when it comes to what this looks like, uh, what are some of those? Is the bank the only group that can help those uh, small businesses complete this application? What other resources will people have in order to help them with this application process? Well, I don't. We don't envision the bank helping people complete the application. I think we'll have to help them either through staff resources or maybe some of those technical resources I was talking about. Um, the bank is just going to service the loans. They're not. They're going to. They are going to underwrite them, but they're going to underwrite them based on our criteria, which would be much more um, lenient is probably the best word to use than than what a traditional bank underwriting of a loan would be, but. I think we're just going to have to help people that have trouble with the application. We're hoping that it's as simple, you know, as possible, and that they can just check the boxes and upload documents and and get through it pretty quickly. Okay, and with this uh, being for some with a no interest forgivable for loans uh, up to two years, what is that continuation look like to mitigate? as far as these small businesses ensuring that they have the correct and, and uh, immediate support that they need and including business advisors, accountant support, what are we going to help see them through that process or is it up to them mm -hmm. to make it through the 10 years? Well, the loan will be a 10 year term, but on the forgivable part, it would be, it would be forgiven before that 10 years is reached. You know, we, we would probably forgive it after three years so um, I, I think once they have the loan, then we're, we, don't, we don't necessarily need to be a part of their business activity. That's, uh, you know, that's being a little too intrusive, but. Um, I don't think that's what, that's not my question. My question okay. is um, if they have concerns um, during that process, during that term, are they eligible or is, will access be available for them to have that support uh, when it comes to accountants or business advisors during that time period, we hadn't envisioned that. I'm, I'm a, I would assume that we will exhaust these resources for this program very quickly, and so it would be really up to council if you wanted to fund some kind of ongoing additional resource like that. Okay. My other uh, question, as we're looking at this disbursement committee. Um, and Joe, uh, Councilwoman Hammond spoke to it, uh, most of it, but I would like to see us have our most vulnerable census tracts represented as far as those uh, businesses that we know are most vulnerable to be a part of this process uh, to ensure that there is true equity in, in those census tracts that uh, we are supposed to give priority to to ensure that they have the success. And I, and I know that's my concern anyway, uh, as I have 
continually expressed uh, with the conversation we had for the briefing um, is that our census tracts that are most vulnerable are the ones that, in my opinion, in, in some aspects may fall through the cracks of this. Um, so we're still going to need to figure out what support we can give to, to those vulnerable businesses. And even with the technical support, uh, we were, again, talking to some of those small businesses. And I guess the question was, uh, who could run? Who would be running some of these programs when it comes to that? Because uh, one small business that we spoke to, you know, the five hundred thousand dollars is is really um, their annual budget for two years. So you know that's going to be a concern for a lot of folks when it comes to that support. Um, well, yeah, you know, we'll we're going to have to take it, you know, application by application on a case by case basis, and and do the best that we can. So, but I, yeah, definitely hear what you're saying about the disbursement committee. Are there any other questions from council for Cassie? Because we have some citizens who signed up to speak. Yes, this is James Cooper. Um, Kathy, um, I thank you for doing this work and um, presenting this as a as an option. Um, and please pass that along to anybody else who joined you in that work. My, my concern, I have, well, a, a lot of it I'll speak to during items from council, but specifically, um, when I think of like the, um, the barber or someone who might be their own employee, they would be able to apply for this. Yes, yes, we are going to let independent contractors and sole proprietors apply. Okay, that's good. I have a lot of that in Ward 2. And then when I think of uh, Southside, you know, just from teaching over there all those years, um, I, I, I wonder what kind of outreach we can do. I don't know what institutionally exists in terms of relationships to, like, the, the mechanics who are over there, the people who own those taquerias and those taco mm -hmm. trucks who might not be members of the Hispanic chamber, might not be members of the Southside chamber. Um, I, I, those, those, those folk are really heavily on my mind and I'm just wondering what outreach might look like to them. Um, we, we're talking about that and working on a marketing plan um, and looking at all the different kinds of resources that we might be able to have some of it is relationships, you know, just people that we know in the community and um, we'll be using those to help get the word out. It could be neighborhood alliance and neighborhood associations. Mm. It could be lots of different things. So, um, yeah, we're definitely thinking about that, thinking about having, you know, in particular Spanish translation um, documents available, things like that. So definitely yeah. been part of part of our discussions. Yeah, you're using some some pretty important words for me. Like I like neighborhood alliance uh, being involved. I love the Spanish translation stuff. Infographics uh, that are shareable on social media, I think, would be beyond mm -hmm. resourceful as well. Yep. Um, yep. And then, and again, I'll speak to this at an items from council portion. But I am so appreciative of this 5.5 million, especially in comparison to the other cities. Um, I would just say to anybody who's listening on the phone uh, outside of council and outside of the people who crafted this, um, for me, while this is commendable, we, yeah, I anticipate that we're going to have to go further. And I would say to anyone listening that um, this is going to be an all hands on deck moment. Um, this is a, something the city's never done. And I don't think it's something that we can undertake just on our own. It's going to require a partnership as well with the state and federal government to really, really make sure that our efforts uh, don't get swept away by by an action at either of those other two levels of government. Yep. yep. And I, I, before we start taking questions from citizens, I would like to, to thank um, Brett Bryant and Joanna McSpadden, Wiley Williams, um, people on my staff, Jeff Seymour and his staff, we have worked so well together on this. And you should all be very proud that you've got a team behind you that really wants to try to make this successful. So um, it, it really has been an all hands on deck kind of thing. So 
Yes, thank you, Kathy. Is there any other council member who wishes to ask her any questions before we go to citizens? Mayor, this is David Greenwell. In regards mm -hmm. to the uh, access to assistance in filling out this application, as well as the numerous programs coming from the federal government, there are organizations already prepared to assist, such as SCORE, the uh, Organization of Retired Executives, and other organizations. It's just a matter of getting the word out. Uh, and as Kathy mentioned, uh, part of that process is just word of mouth and uh, uh, an informal network of getting access to these groups. And also certain organizations such as the Oklahoma City Chamber, the South Oklahoma City Chamber, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, they currently have plans to assist in that effort as well. So. Uh, all I can suggest is that it's just a matter of timing before more of this type of assistance becomes known and available, but it's certainly on everybody's mind. Thank you. Yep. Okay. And by the way, it's worth you know driving home the point that none of this would be possible without the voters approving um, you know this uh, SIP program in 2007 and 2017. Uh, we really wouldn't know where to turn for these resources if not for that. And so thank goodness for that. Um, and also, again, thank goodness for the Alliance, the Chamber, and our city staff for working together on this. Let me call on uh, a few citizens who signed up to speak. Uh, we'll start with Gary Goldman. Um, and Gary, if you wouldn't mind stating your name and address, I neglected to ask you that earlier, and, uh, and keep your remarks to three minutes. Gary, you're recognized. Gary? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, Gary Goldman, uh, G-A-R-Y-G-O-L-D-M-A-N. Uh, business address is 714 North Broadway, Oklahoma City, 73102. Uh, first off, uh, Kathy, uh, fantastic job um, putting all this together and, and, and answering all the questions. It's much appreciated. Um, just a couple quick um, questions for the um, No Interest Forgivable uh, Small Business Loan Program. Um, the, uh, the answer you gave me, the loan will be forgiven if you retain the number of employees over a three-year period. How many employees are you referring to when you say the number of employees? Um, the number that you state you have when we begin this process to the date when it's forgiven, is I would assume how it would work. So it, it could be any number of employees that we that we have on. It wouldn't have to be our full. If we had 40 employees, but we're obviously not using 40 employees over a couple months, but we had you, would we still qualify for that? Yes, I think so. I mean, we're just some of these really specific things are going to have to be taken on a case by case basis when you apply and when we have the bank take a look at the loan applications. Okay, then the last questions are just loan versus grant questions. I know some of these are pretty simple, but uh, the small business, the $10,000 cash incentive, um, um, it is reimbursed. So that is a grant? It is an, we have to call it an incentive payment. So it is a cash payment to the company less than 15 employees um, based on reimbursing payroll expenses. Okay, so is that outside of the loan or grant you, the, program? No, I, 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 um, you can only apply for a grant or a loan, not both. And you can only uh, apply for one of the loans. So is what I just talked about, is that, you said it's an incentive uh, program, is that a loan or a grant? The $10,000 is an incentive payment. You might call it a grant. We can't call it that. Okay. And then on the um, small business program, the, uh, obviously the forgive, forgivable, uh, uh, no interest forgivable loan, I assume that's a grant? 
It's a loan. It will have a loan agreement and a promissory note. Okay. Like a loan. Uh, that's a loan. And then the low interest, but then there's a low interest 2% 10 year. Right? That, that, that sounds like a loan. That is a loan. And it's for a larger amount of money. That's why there's an interest payment. Okay. And then the small business technical assistance, that's a loan or grant? No, we will, we will pay the provider of those services directly. We will match a business with a provider, develop a scope of work, and pay the provider directly on behalf of the, the business. Okay. So in summary, services. all I've, I've heard um, is from the differentiation between loan and grant is there's on this list, there's two grants and two loans and one incentive payment program. No, there's, there's one, there's one grant program and that's, it's the $10,000 for businesses with less than 15 employees. Okay. All right. That's my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, moving on to John Pettis. And John, if you're on the line, uh, don't forget to unmute your phone and please state your name and address and keep your remarks to three minutes. John? Okay, we're gonna move on to uh, Apollo Wood. Apollo, uh, uh, you're recognized. Again, state your name, address, and keep your remarks to three minutes. And star six is one way to unmute your phone, I guess, other than the usual way. The only way. <laughs> Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, oh. <laughs> John and Apollo. Okay, John, you, you, you can go first, and then Apollo will go after that. Go ahead, John. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members. Council, John Pettis, 1332 Northeast 54th Street, Oklahoma City, 73111. Uh, I'd like to thank the staff for this initial program. Most of my questions have been answered, but I still have three that I need clarification on. Number one is, will companies who pay their employees by check and at the end of the year, give them a 1099, would they be eligible to participate? Um, so is the company using independent contractors? Yes, and they give them a 1099. Um, yes, they can apply. And I, the way we're looking at it right now, independent contractors can apply as well. So we'll just have to take it on a, you know, like I said, a case-by-case -case basis as people apply. Okay. Uh, once this is up and running, do you have an anticipated turnaround time for application from uh, application stage to approval? Yes. We, so we, we hope, as I mentioned earlier, to start accepting applications on April 6th, we will, we will probably have to have a cutoff date because we're gonna get more applications than we have money for. Um, and then after that cutoff date, we'll start scoring them. Um, the, the applications will be evaluated against a you know, set criteria, and then we will begin to make payments. I would expect we will begin to make payments at the end of, by the end of April, last week of April-ish is what I'm hoping. Okay, my, my last question is, in reading HR 748, there's a, there's a possibility that the city could receive some funds from the federal, from the federal government to basically augment this program. If those funds are received, will the city continue, will, it, will they add those funds to this program or once this program has been, has spent the $5.5 million, that's the end of it? Well, I mean, I think obviously that's up to council, but we'll have to look at what the 
what the regulations and the rules are that come down with that federal money and see if we can um, if we need to adapt this program any or if we can just use this one. But yeah, we'll just have to wait and see what what all that how all that plays out. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now Apollo Woods. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor Apollo Woods. I'll catch you, Blackie. Um, uh, many of my questions have been answered, and thank you to uh, Catherine, the Alliance, and her team, Oklahoma City Chamber, and the staff. I uh, just wanted to point out some positive things. We're working very closely with our, our minority and black-owned restaurants here in Oklahoma City, as well as some of our other colleagues as well. What I do want to say is that um, with this going on with this pandemic, there's been a lot of organic community effort coming together, which has been great to see. Um, a lot of increased activity on social media, through websites, practicing social distancing. Um, I, I, I do get pretty amped up when I see people in, in crowds together, especially walking through the parks and trails. But, you know, people are going to do what they're going to do. Um, we are encouraging them to oblige, oblige uh, social distancing. Um, businesses are becoming very creative to stay afloat. Uh, we are a resilient community. Um, reaching out to colleagues across the different cities, across the city. What I'm glad to hear is that the technical assistance uh, part is included in this component, which is very important. I think right now um, this seems like a great short-term solution, but my concern is, is that I'm looking at business long-term. So hopefully from this initiative, um, they will spark some long-term solutions or strategies to support our, our, um, our, our small businesses and minority-owned businesses long-term. Um, I do believe that this is an opportunity for our minority-owned businesses to build sustain a sustainable framework, business credit and capital. So I'm excited to see that. Um, one question that I have is, um, well, comment, is that I, I don't believe that our, the word is getting out beyond the same networks that have been used. Um, so I also manage the Black Leadership Network, and we've created a digital resource guide. Um, we have over 1,600 black professors in our group. Um, but beyond that, there's not a lot of information being gathered. So I'd like to offer myself as a, um, as a resource, as a connector, as a bridge builder to make sure this information, like this and others, get shared through those small businesses and entrepreneurs on network. Um, I'm grateful that this is happening. Um, I, I believe that we will get through this, and thank you, Mayor, and the, and the council members and staff for being frontliners as well. Um, you all are also taking risks, um, and I think that, that was really my only uh, comment or concern about getting the word out. So Kathy and the Mayor's office and uh, council members, if I can do anything to get the word out to our locally-owned, minority-owned, black-owned businesses in Oklahoma City metro area, um, please uh, consider me as a resource. Thank you, Apollo. I appreciate that. Um, we we haven't really gotten much of the word out yet because we needed to wait until after today. So. Okay. I'm available. Uh, this is this is Councilman Cooper. Um, Apollo, I'm glad that you called. And um, it's funny because your name was a name that was on my mind in terms of someone who would be a good uh, connective thread to our um, to our small business community. So uh, I'm glad you're already trying to sign yourself up. <laughs> Anywhere I can. Okay. Uh, that's all our citizens who have signed up to speak. Um, we could now entertain a motion to uh, adopt item P. Uh, uh, if Move you don't mind, I have another question. I'm sorry, Councilwoman Knight? Yeah, I just I had a question when it comes to uh, as we were listening to some of those questions and concerns. Is it possible to get regular reports for the applicants and and those who get funded and to understand uh, maybe as to why some of those applicants may not have been approved, so we can understand where we may need to work uh, when it comes to uh, better resources or other alternatives for our small businesses. Yes, and I, I think one thing that I, I failed to mention or would like to suggest is that maybe, you know, for the next council meeting or the next few council meetings, that there be an item on the agenda or a report where we can update you on how this is going. Um, and, and yes, I think it'll be interesting to see kind of where the gaps are and, and if people don't qualify why they are and, and things like that. So yeah, we're definitely going to be be looking at those kind of trends. So 
Okay, any other questions from council? Okay, if not, uh, is there a motion to adopt the, the resolution? Move the item. Move for approval. Second. Move for approval. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner? Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nye? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All right, we are now going to move back in our agenda. Uh, we are ready for the bond sale. And this bring, means that item 8E through J, I am now going to address all at once. I'm going to, for legal reasons, I'm going to speak for a while here. Uh, reading some things, and then we're going to go back, and Brent Bryant's going to walk us through, and we'll take uh, a, a, a series of votes. So, just to describe uh, for public notice, item 8E1 is an award purchase of the $51,265,000 City of Oklahoma City General Obligation Bond Series 2020 to the bidder whose bid is determined to offer the lowest true interest cost. Item 8E2 is an ordinance on final hearing with an emergency providing for the issuance of general obligation bonds in the sum of $51,265,000 by the City of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, authorized at an election duly called and held for such purpose, prescribing form of bonds, providing for a combined bond issue designated general obligation bond series 2020, providing for registration thereof, designating the registrar for the issue, providing for levy of an annual tax for the payment of principal and interest on the bonds and fixing other details of the issue approving the form of a continuing disclosure agreement and an official statement and authorizing executions and actions necessary for the issuance and delivery of the bond. Item 8F is a resolution authorizing the sale of $51,265,000 of general obligation bonds, Series 2020 of the City of Oklahoma, City, Oklahoma, fixing the amount of bonds to mature each year, fixing the time and place the bonds are to be sold, authorizing the publication of a notice of sale, approving and authorizing official statements and distribution thereof, authorizing executions and actions necessary for issuance and delivery of the bonds. Item G is stricken from the agenda. Item H1 is an award purchase of the $60 million, $260,215,000 City of Oklahoma City, general obligation bonds, taxable series 2020 to the bidder whose bid is determined to offer the lowest true interest cost. Item 8H2 is an ordinance on final hearing will, with an emergency, providing for the issuance of general obligation bonds in the sum of $60,215,000 by the City of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, authorized at an election duly called and held for such purpose, prescribing form of bonds, providing for a combined bond issue designated general obligation bonds, taxable series 2020, providing for registration thereof, designating the registrar for the issue, providing for levy of an annual tax for the payment of principal and interest on the bonds and fixing other details of the issue, approving the form of a continuing disclosure agreement and an official statement, and authorizing executions and actions necessary for the issuance and delivery of the bond. Item 8I is a resolution authorizing the sale of $60,215,000 in general obligation bonds, taxable series 2020 of the City of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, fixing the amount of bonds to mature each year, fixing the time and place the bonds are to be sold, authorizing the publication of a notice of sale, approving and authorizing official statements and distribution thereof, authorizing executions and actions necessary for issuance and delivery of the bonds. Item 8J is stricken from the agenda. With that, we'll return back to item E, and I would turn it over to the city manager, maybe to present some other necessary information. Yeah, so Brent Bryan is on the line and will give us an update on the results of the sale. Yes, sir. Uh, Brent Bryant, finance director. On item 8E1, um, today we, we had a really good day in the market. We've been concerned in the last couple of weeks about the market, but we had a very good day today with the market. On the $51,265,000 general obligation bond series 2020. So we had a total of six bids today with the lowest uh, and the lowest bid. We recommend the lowest bid go to JP Morgan Securities LLC. 
with a true interest cost of 2.614628. Uh, again, we recommend for the Series 2020 general obligation bonds, um, recommend that to JP Morgan Securities LLC with a true interest cost of 2.614628. Um, and following, uh, in addition to that, uh, Uh, in addition to that, I need to read off the maturities that have been provided. Um, I will like to announce that the completed documents are available under the heading March 31st, 2020, City Council Ad Additional Materials, and it can be located at www.okc forward slash departments forward slash city dash clerk. Um, regarding the 2020 bonds, uh, with those maturing in, in, in Mar on March 1st of 2022, they had an interest rate of 2%. The 23s had an interest rate of 2%. The 24s had an interest rate of 2%. The 25s had an interest rate of 2%. Um, and, the, and the maturities from 26 through 28 had a maturity of 2, have an interest rate of 2%. For maturities from 20, from 2029 through 2040, they all had an interest rate of 4%. And that's, that's everything as it relates to item 8EI, 1 and 2. I believe we need to vote on that, those separately, and then we'll vote on item H1. And two. So I'll move item E, 8E1. Second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second, which I will take as being for item E1, the award purchase. We do need to vote on that, correct, Craig? Yes. Okay. All right, so any further discussion on that? Item E1, 8E1. Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner. Yes. Cooper. Yes. McAtee. Yes. Stone. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Nye. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Now we'll need a couple votes on AE2. First is the ordinance and then we'll take an emergency. So is there a motion to approve item AE2? Move the ordinance. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Griner. Yes. Cooper. Yes. McAtee. Yes. Stum. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Nice. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Now I uh, would entertain a motion for the uh, to adopt the emergency on that ordinance found in 8E2. I'd move to adopt an emergency on the ordinance. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Griner. Yes. Cooper. Yes. McTee. Yes. Stone. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Nine. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes. All right. Motion for the emergency passes unanimously and with the required seven vote. Okay. New information. We are also striking item F. We had already previously stricken item G. Okay. Now we go to 8H1. Uh, this is the award purchase of, of the uh, bonds for $60,215,000. Uh, the 
Brent, did you talk about that or do we have to go back to you again? Oh, we have to go back to me, sir. And one thing I'd like okay. to recognize, I would like to recognize my assistant finance director, Angela Pierce and Mike Baskin, who've been working tirely, tirelessly behind the, the scenes right now, getting this together. And I just wanted to recognize them. Um, today, uh, we also had a good day issuing uh, $60,215,000 in taxable series general obligation bonds 2020. We had a total of five bids today. Um, and we recommend the award to Citigroup Global Markets Incorporated with a true interest cost of 2.685850. Um, one thing I would like to just advise, let council know, our tax exempt bonds that we sold had a true interest cost of 2.61. Our taxable bonds that we sold today had a true interest cost of 2.68. So, there was a, and, uh, so we got really good rates on both taxable and tax exempt today. So uh, with that, we recommend approval of, of award to the Citigroup Global Markets Incorporated again for true interest costs of 2.685850. And now I'll read the maturities for that um, issuance. Um, with the, uh, the, the items maturing in 2022, 3%. 2023, 3%, 24, 3%, 25, 3%, 25, 26%, 2.75, 27%, 28%, 2%, 29%, 2.25, 30s, 2.45, 31s, 2.375, 32s, 2.45, 33s, 2.5, 34s 2.625, 35s 2.75, 36 uh, maturity 2.875, and then we had term bonds for 37, 38, 39, and 40 at 3%. Uh, and again, we recommend, we had five bids, and we recommend Citigroup Global Markets Incorporated at a true interest cost of 2.685850. I already paid a pack, so I really don't need another whole pack. If you're not a council member of Brent Bryant, please mute your phone. Thank you. Brent, please continue. I am, that, that's all I have, Mayor. Okay. All right, so we are on Item 8H1, this is the award purchase of $60,215,000. Is there a motion to approve? I'd move item 8H1 that we award the purchase to Citigroup. Second. Got a motion and a second. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner. Greiner. Yes. Cooper. I thought she was quitting. Cooper. Cooper. Yes. McAtee. Yes. Stone. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Nine. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. 8H2 is the ordinance on final hearing relative to these bonds for $60,215,000. Is there a motion for adoption? Move the item. Second. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Griner. Yes. Cooper. Yes. McAtee. Yes. Stone. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Knight. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Now the emergency for that ordinance at item 8H2. Is there a motion? I'd move, I'd move the ordinance as an emergency. Second. 
Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner. Yes. Cooper. Yes. McAtee. Yes. Stone. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Nice. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Uh, motion passes unanimously and with the required seven votes. Uh, now I will go ahead and strike item I as well. 8I is stricken. 8J was previously stricken. All right. This places us back on schedule now. We will return to item 8Q. We do not need executive session. 8Q1 is a resolution approving the request for salary continuation for Lieutenant Kevin Bryant, et cetera. Is there a motion? Move the red Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner. Yes. Cooper. Yes. McAtee. Yes. Stone. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Nice. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes, motion passes unanimously. 8R, resolution authorizing the municipal counselor to confess judgment without admitting liability in the United States District Court case titled Dawson v. City of OKC. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? Move the resolution. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner. Yes. Cooper. Yes. McAtee. Yes. Stone. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Nye. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. 8 S1, resolution authorizing the municipal counselor to commence judgment without admitting liability in the United States District Court for the Western District of Oklahoma case styled. Knudsen versus the City of OKC. Don't believe we need executive session. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? Move the resolution. Second. second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner. Yes. Cooper. Yes. McAtee. Yes. Stone. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Knight. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Now we're at 8T1, claims recommended for denial. Uh, don't believe we need executive session. No one has signed up to speak. Uh, would, would entertain a motion to deny the claim. Move the claims for denial. Second. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner. Yes. Cooper. Yes. McAtee. Yes. Stone. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Nice. Yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes, motion passes unanimously. 9A1, claims recommended for approval. Don't believe we need executive session. No one has signed up to speak. Is there a motion to approve the claim? So moved. So moved. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner. Yes. Cooper. Yes. McAtee. Yes. Stone. Aye. Greenwell. Yes. Hammond. Yes. Knight. Yes. yes. Stone Cipher. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. 
Now we're at item, item 10, items from council. Uh, we have one listed item here. 10A is a resolution encouraging residents to respond to the 2020 census and designating April 1st as census day. Councilwoman Hammond. Thank you. Um, when I originally approached our public information office about helping me write this resolution and get it on the agenda, I had hoped that we would be in a bit of a different situation and um, that we could host a few of our census partners at council meeting and have a nice photo op, but um, unfortunately we are not. But nevertheless, um, I think especially given this disaster, we recognize how important getting a complete count of our residents um, throughout the city is, and um, and and particularly, you know, those undercounted groups that I know the um, our public information office has been doing a great job with all of our partners um, to just get the word out. I've seen a lot of really great um, stuff on social media from various um, representatives throughout the community promoting this, and I think this could be an opportunity just to um, have that extra kind of flourish, I guess, of um, making sure that locally we're declaring tomorrow, April 1st, as census day and really encouraging folks to fill out their census. Um, I know, I, I, I believe we're in a competition with Tulsa um, to get a, a higher count and knowing that from the, um, you know, the state level, I know our, I believe it's our Chamber of Commerce at the state level and um, Department of Commerce and so forth are doing some work at getting the count out as well, but anything we can do to encourage our residents um, uh, I think will will hopefully help us beat Tulsa <laughs> and make sure that we have an accurate count so we get as much funding um, from the federal government and have all of the right representation in our communities. Um, so I'll motion for approval of this resolution. Second. We got a motion and a second. Any uh, further discussion? Hearing none, uh, clerk, please call the roll. Greiner. Yes. Cooper? Yes. McAtee? Yes. Stone? Aye. Greenwell? Yes. Hammond? Yes. Nice? Yes. Stone Cipher? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. The resolution is adopted on April 1st is Census Day, and I do of course, join uh, Councilwoman Hammond and the rest of the council in encouraging everyone to please participate. We will now go around an imaginary horseshoe and we'll start with Ward 1. I don't and if you have nothing to say, just say nothing to say, Mayor, or somehow acknowledge it so I can move on. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ward 2. Yes. <clears throat> so, thank you. Um, I really want to applaud again um, Kathy and Brent and anybody who worked on the um, the 5.5 million in incentives and no low to no interest loans to our small business community. Um, I suspect we'll be back to ask for more because the the calls I get from my small business community and um, they're so thankful for this moment where our city is stepping up. And um, it makes me think there's going to be some more steps. Um, very specifically, though, uh, I, I'm not saying that this is the city's position currently. What I am saying is these are, th this is where I'm at with this moment. And I really just want to be on record uh, saying this. So um, I think that we need to, um, I think to meet this moment with the seriousness it demands, we need our country's federal government to work with us to strengthen our city's efforts. Um, with our physical distancing efforts, we're of course working to slow the spread of the, of the disease. Um, however, to keep our people safe and to begin making right our city's economy, we need a clear strategy from FEMA and our White House regarding, I would say, four action items. Number one, what is the plan to implement nationwide mass testing, starting with first responders, healthcare workers, people over 60, folk in long-term care facilities, and immunocompromised individuals? What's the specific plan to increase drastically the production and distribution of tests, 
including necessary chemicals and kits to collect specimens. Critically, what's our plan to implement something similar to the successful strategy we're seeing in South Korea, which has, and this is from Science Magazine, South Korea has the most expansive and well-organized testing program in the world. According to Science Magazine, quote, South Korea has tested more than 270,000 people, which amounts to more than 5,200 tests per million inhabitants, and that is more than any other country except tiny Bahrain. This approach has slowed the disease without resorting to authoritarianism. Um, moreover, South Korea, and again, this is from um, Science Magazine, South Korea demonstrates, quote, diagnostic capacity at scale is key to epidemic control. And that was them quoting from Raina uh, McIntyre, an emerging infectious disease scholar at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. And now moving out from the quote, I just want to say that with this approach from FEMA and our White House, our city will have an opportunity to expand testing wi widely to young and old alike, allowing us to find where local spread is occurring so we can socially isolate folk and prevent the disease from spreading into more communities. So that's one action item, mass text testing. Uh, number two, um, to implement mass testing nationally, we need to know FEMA and our White House's plan to produce and distribute personal protective equipment to first responders and healthcare workers. Right now, our White House through FEMA requires local and state governments to exhaust, exhaust all efforts to secure PPE. And while our city takes such steps, we wait. Why? Specifically, what's the plan to keep safe those on the front line administering these tests? What's FEMA and our White House's plan to increase drastically the production and distribution of ventilators as well? So that's mass testing and personal protect protection equipment. Number three, I am thankful to Oklahoma's congressional delegation for passing a historic $2 trillion relief package. Too many of my neighbors, friends, and Ward 2 constituents lost their jobs due to COVID. The relief coming from Congress will save lives, but only if Congress takes further action to invest in individuals or people can pay rent, buy groceries, purchase prescriptions, etc. Four, moreover, what's the plan from Congress in a follow-up relief package to help our city's small business community pay rent and utilities to help retain workers. So again, mass testing, personal protective equipment, further investment in individuals, and further investment in our small business community. Taken together, these four action items have the potential to slow the spread of the, of the disease, save lives, and begin making right our city's economy. At the local level, I am proud of the historic vote City Council took today to support our small business community. But without state and federal government as willing partners, our efforts amount to a Band-Aid on a dam, and our local efforts must not be in vain. We have cause for concern. A conservative commentator, Rich Lowry, notes regarding COVID-19, quote, President Trump spent the initial weeks minimizing the threat and talking of it magically disappearing, end quote. And again, this is from a conservative commentator. We cannot afford an action. We cannot rely on magical thinking. We cannot stay home forever. And that's the end of that quote. And this is me now. We must move swift to slow the spread of the disease, save lives, and begin making right our city's economy. Too many Ward 2 residents worked too hard to write Oklahoma City's recent renaissance story, and their work must not be in vain. Finally, again, we've got to make sure that we are remembering our Oklahoma standard here, um, that we are resilient. It's who we are from the native peoples who first settled this land to the Dust Bowl to this very moment. And I would say we are in a moment that is the Spanish flu meets the Great Depression, meets 9-11, meets the financial crash. Um, this, this, is, this needs to be an all hands on deck moment. We, we cannot, we cannot not meet this moment. Um, 
I would encourage everybody who would like to know where I'm getting these resources, why I'm thinking about mass testing the way that I am, why I'm thinking about personal protective equipment the way that I am. There was a PBS NewsHour segment. It's entitled, and you can Google this, PBS NewsHour, why the U.S. is still severely constrained in ability to test for COVID-19. So those are my thoughts. I, I just do not like the idea of an action. I do not like the idea of telling our people, let's physical, physically distance each, each other, from each other, but not have a plan of how we're going to end this, this moment. And, um, and so those are the four action items I would recommend as the council person uh, forward to. And in concluding, I would say this has been weighing heavily on me um, as I've learned about our incredible efforts from the emergency management team at securing that personal protective equipment. I am so thankful to Franklin Barnes for his work. I think they're doing incredible work. And now they need a partner in the White House who's going to help them really do the work that we need to get out of this moment. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how First Christian Church was a sanctuary in the aftermath of, um, of the Oklahoma City bombing. And because of that, I just feel a responsibility to step up and talk about how we are going to get out of this and not just um, remain at home. So thank you for listening. And uh, thank you, Council, for the vote you took today. And thank you, Mayor, for the work you're doing. Um, just thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ward 3. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Just a, a one observation or comment. Thank you for your comments, James. Uh, what uh, we did this morning was to pass the Small Business Continuity Program uh, intended to uh, help our small businesses pay rent, pay their employees, and jumpstart the economy. Hopefully, we'll keep our eye on that target as we move forward. And everybody has a, a different approach as to how this could be implemented. But uh, if we come together and implement it in a cohesive manner, uh, we'll have some results that uh, will meet the need and will make our small businesses and the employees that they service uh, successful through some very difficult times. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Ward 4? I'm good. Thanks, Mayor. Ward 5? Your Honor, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and first of all, thanks to all the city employees who have done a, a great job during this difficult time, uh, as well as everybody throughout the city. Just to remind uh, individuals, the actions we took this morning with respect to assisting privately owned businesses, small businesses, that's just one of many programs currently in place. Funding is is already coming through to businesses. The uh, well over a week ago, the Families First Act was passed, which provided for paid leave for individuals impacted by the virus, as well as uh, both directly in terms of those who are uh, who. Uh, contract the disease as well as family members that need to stay at home or situations where uh, child care is not available. Also, uh, many payroll tax incentives in terms of tax credits and reimbursements to employers are being provided for those who retain employees. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program uh, businesses can gain up to $10 million in terms of loans. Uh, of that, the first two months worth of expenses in terms of wages, health insurance, utilities, uh, rent, mortgage payments, those are eligible for forgiveness uh, for the first two months. We anticipate more support will be coming along once the government has an idea as to uh, the ability to take advantage of these programs. So the key is knowing where to apply, how to access this assistance that is readily available waiting to gain access uh, from businesses. So uh, be on the lookout for all that information. And uh, it's really just a matter of of, uh, of 
pursuing that information and, and these funds are currently available. So thank you, Mayor, and good luck to everyone. And, and uh, hopefully we will uh, get through this uh, in a manner that is not uh, too damaging. And one thing, Mayor, that I think might be helpful is if we could, whether it's through the City County Health Department or some other means, uh, obtain information in terms of how local hospitals are doing in terms of any supplies, equipment that they may be uh, needing that they currently don't have available. Uh, we know a lot in the healthcare industry uh, have been impacted in terms of elective surgeries and, and more normal routine type preventative uh, appointments and care have been uh, terminated. So there's a group within the healthcare profession that are beginning to see uh, situations where they don't have as much work as they normally do and possibly even some layoffs are, are taking place in the healthcare industry depending upon what type of healthcare uh, they're providing. Thank you. Thank you, Ward 6. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to echo, I believe a few council members have uh, commended our, our city staff and in particular, I know so many of our staff and folks at the city county health department have been working just nonstop the past two weeks and beyond um, trying to respond to this. And um, in particular though, I'd like to just um, commend our public information office um, I don't, I don't know how they are keeping up with everything. Um, just the amount of information that um, as things have changed so quickly, I just really commend them for um, keeping the public informed. Um, and then somehow in the midst of all of this, also creating new accounts on social media for our Spanish speaking residents um, is just really amazing. And I just wanna say thank you to all of their how responsive they've been across social media platforms as well as just proactive and getting graphics ready for um, the various emergency orders and just um, making sure that that information is as digestible for the public as possible. Um, I'd also like to speak to you, I know I brought this up at um, council two weeks ago, but um, I'd also like to just again, uh, make mention of all the people in the city um, that are experiencing homelessness right now. They're a particularly vulnerable population. And I know we have city staff as well as multiple agencies um, that are partners in the community that have been, again, just working day to day to respond and, um, and figure out how to continue serve, serving those, um, those folks um, at a distance. Um, I know a lot of, uh, you know, the work is trying to continue to implement our housing first. Um, philosophy and, and get folks that they can into housing as quickly as possible. But we know we have a lot of folks that are still um, living unsheltered and um, trying to communicate with those folks, get them resources, um, and also find ways to get them shelter, um, particularly for people who might be experiencing symptoms or need to isolate from um, from the greater community. And in particular, I'd like to mention and just um, anyone who's on this call or any other council members that can help advocate um, at this level. I know a group of um, partners have come together in Oklahoma City to request, um, essentially we have the resources for locations for that emergency shelter opportunity um, to help get people inside and, um, and, and distance from one another. Um, but the, the issue that uh, we're running into is staffing. So um, I know they've put an application together through our emergency manage, management department to get National Guard nurses and other healthcare staff through National Guard. Um, but we just need as much advocacy as possible um, to get those, those resources to the city because right now, you know, with rain last night, the storms we've had, um, anyone who might be experiencing symptoms or, um, and already has, you know, real vulnerable um, mental health or physical health needs um, just is uh, is really inhumane to be 
to be leaving folks outside in that situation. So just any advocacy that um, that can be provided to help those partners who've been just working nonstop to serve people with already, you know, a lot of barriers and very little resources to do that in a crisis. Um, you know, they need all the support that that they can from our city leadership and um, and above. So I appreciate um, appreciate the assistance. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ward Seven. Yes, um, I also wanted to commend our staff uh, for everything that's been happening since uh, we have entered this uh, pandemic for our city. And I especially want to thank uh, those that are still working, especially our sanitation city workers, our utility workers, our public works uh, workers that you see still doing the job in those trucks and cars passing by. Uh, still during this process, so we definitely commend them for the work that they're doing throughout uh, this time to ensure that the city continues to progress. Um, um, a couple of things I wanted to mention. The first one is today's literally the last day of Women's History Month, and um, as I mentioned, the last meeting, council meeting, I mentioned some of those female mayors that we have in our our state of Oklahoma, and I failed to mention one, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned that there is a female mayor also in Boley, Oklahoma. Um, so there's some wonderful things happening there right now as far as uh, to reestablish and rehabilitate um, uh, different parts of Boley. So uh, under that leadership and just community members stepping in, uh, we're able to see those take place. Uh, some of the other things I want to mention uh, are the resilience, the resilience of the community in Ward 7, especially during this process of what's going on. Um, I want to commend Restore OKC and uh, the partnership they had with Skyline Urban Ministries. They had a food giveaway last week, and they fed over 100 families uh, with groceries that came through uh, drive-through method and. Um, just to, to know people are able to have a need met in the community, it truly means a lot when you have entities such as uh, Restore OKC, uh, Skyline Ministries, and all those partners that help to make sure that those families are, are being fed, and also our school system to make sure our young people are getting fed. And we do know there have been new um, schools that have been added to the school meals program, including in uh, our community, Douglas High School, and Menace Lakeview uh, for those young people that we know, uh, 0 to 18, who may need meals, that they can also go to those particular areas besides elementary school locations. Uh, we also want to commend uh, Fairview Baptist Church. They did a food giveaway this past weekend as well. And this is uh, what we talk about, you know, it, as the um, <coughs> mayor spoke about in your comments, this is the time to be a neighbor, and we have seen resiliency in folks being neighbors to of those that are around them, uh, but we also uh, also are happy that those folks, and we hope uh, that they are still continuing to stay safe and that social distancing aspect and, and just ensuring that while they are being safe, that they're still also taking care of others. So we thank everybody for that. Um, I want to make mention of the National Cowboy Western and Heritage Museum. Uh, it sits in the Adventure District in Ward 7, and if you have not been following their Twitter, uh, you should, because Cowboy Tim has taken off and taken flight and given joy to a lot of folks through through this time, and hashtag the cowboy um, has received international recognition um, during this time to highlight the things that are happening at the museum. So uh, the great thing about what is taking place, although it's bittersweet that we can't get outside uh, for a lot of us, we can experience some of those places we've never been, including uh, a museum such as this and the intricate details of, of different things that people may or may not have paid attention to. So uh, with that, I know they're, they have grown as far as their uh, support in their uh, social media in a, a lot, quite a bit, 379% on Instagram, 49% on Facebook, and 2,058% uh, on Twitter. That's just for one account. So uh, this speaks to, again, the resiliency that we still have for our, uh, uh, during this time and also uh, with our Oklahoma City Zoo. This is a hard time for uh, them, um, as we know, but they still have the zoo at two 
that people can uh, tune in and watch. So those are just a few things that are happening uh, when it comes to some of those places I wanted to highlight as well. Um, as also our, our restaurants and um, our our chefs, and I want to say thank you to those chefs and those businesses that are still operating in mind with those workers that are unable to work. Um, when, when I say that, I know of a, a chef in, in Ward 7 that is purchasing food, enough food for his uh, wait staff and the people that work for him to ensure that they have a meal. So, you know, it's those things where we have to take care of each other as well. And um, also, we look at other restaurants that are still open in the community, and we have quite a few that are in business, and unfortunately, we, we had some that just couldn't take uh, the hit that came, and they had to shut their doors. But I would encourage uh, folks to still make sure we're doing that online ordering and curbside ordering for a lot of those businesses, especially a, a lot of those minority businesses that we know are still in operation, and you can find a list of those on social media, too. And I know in, in general, want to commend uh, Florence's. Uh, if you hadn't seen that, a couple weeks ago, they were on uh, Guy Ferrari Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, uh, and they we, they were on there talking about their uh, business, and it was really timely for them to be on there in the midst of what's taking place. So I hope people will still continue to patron all of those places, especially those in Ward 7, those businesses that really need our assistance and our support. Um, a, a couple other things. Uh, Physicians Week, it is Physicians Week, so we definitely want to say thank you to all of our physicians that are uh, working overtime to ensure that we are um, able to get the resources and the help to those who need it the most, especially uh, those who have received those positive results due to COVID-19 um, and that they get the support that they truly need. Um, I know one of the things that we talked about, uh, James and I, when we went on our congressional trip with NLC was broadband. And right now, this is something that I believe on a city level, we, we all as council members can continue to advocate uh, for better access and broadband in our rural areas and those um, other areas that we know are unable to receive it, especially during this time uh, when we know our, our, our school districts are going online as far as a lot of that on learning um, and for our young people to ensure that they get all of the resources that they need so they won't fall in the cracks and be left behind. Um, as far as our seniors, I know um, I've been trying to understand what some of those needs are for some of our seniors that may are that may be self-dependent. Um, and I understand for some who may be on assistance, they are able to get groceries, but uh, they aren't able to use uh, whatever assistance they have for paper products. So if there's anyone that can assist in, in helping some of our seniors with that effort, that would be a, a great thing that we would be able to help with our seniors as well. So uh, with that, uh, again, I just uh, want to say please make sure we are continuing the social distancing, shelter in place, um, and we will definitely get through this uh, as a city. So thank you. Thank you, Ward A. Yes, just briefly, uh, Your Honor, a couple of things. I was so sad to read this morning the Steve Lackmeyer article about uh, Gerald Rappaport. Uh, I don't know if everyone knew him, but uh, Gerald was the uh, general manager of the Skirvin Hotel. He was a top-notch hospitality manager who loved uh, his guests. He loved his uh, employees, and he most of all loved to promote and protect the Skirvin, which is a uh, a treasured historic landmark for Oklahoma City. Uh, when he came to the city, he embraced the city. He was active with nonprofits. Uh, he will be missed. He, Gerald was 58 years of age. Uh, my condolences uh, go out to his wife, Nancy. Secondly, um, the, I wanted to tell the city council that on April 14th, the Judiciary Committee will be coming to you uh, with a proposal through Judicial Order 2005 Will, which will extend the uh, penalty reduction program, was, which was set to end today. Uh, our goal with that uh, reduction program was to collect uh, $200,000. And despite what's happened the last two weeks, uh, we're at $195,000. So we're going to ask the city council to extend that program on April the 14th. Finally, uh, my thoughts and prayers go out to all the families 
who are suffering uh, because of this virus, who have lost loved ones. I pray every day for uh, the hospital staffers, the first responders, the nurses, and the doctors. Uh, may God be with you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes items from Council. Item 11 is City Manager Reports. Yeah, um, the only thing that we have on today is claims and payroll, but I do want to say, I just mentioned a thanks to Mayor Holt and to the council for leadership during this crisis. Um, I also appreciate the council members who've made mention of the many city employees who are continuing to serve. We're doing all we can to provide as much flexibility as possible, either in work from home or flexible leave usage to be able to protect our employees where we can, but also ensure that we can continue to provide the critical services that we provide. So many of those services you know, some of them are upfront and obvious with our first responders who are doing a great job, police and fire and welfare workers out there doing their jobs every day, are responding to assist our, our residents, but also uh, the other jobs that aren't so noticeable unless you don't have those services and being like water and wastewater and the solid waste services, street repairs, just all those different services that our employees provide and the many employees that we have that work behind the scenes that aren't recognized in what they're doing on a daily basis, just in there doing their work every day. And our employees are doing a great job. Um, our leaders within the city are doing a really good job to help um, our employees stay safe, but also to be able to serve our residents. So I just want to say thank you to everyone and just publicly thank our employees for um, the work that they're doing. That's all I have. Great. Yeah, well, so grateful to our city employees who are on the front line. Um, we have uh, now on to item 12, citizens to be heard. We have none who have signed up. Uh, that concludes the business on our agenda, and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.